Our panelists uh, have joined us. Uh, newly joining us is Dr. Del Tackett. Thank you for being here with us. And uh, introducing to you also Dr. Michael Horton. And you'll be hearing from both of these gentlemen uh, later in the conference. And Dr. Meyer, thank you for the uh, tour de force earlier uh, as we looked at uh, uh, just the scientific inquiry and making a biblical case uh, for that and a framework for that. Uh, in our first question, uh, it's going to come straight to you. Um, in 1987, the Supreme Court overruled the case for teaching creationism alongside with evolution and was passed as unconstitutional. Does teaching a variety of scientific theories hinder students? Maybe you can comment on just where we've been from a legal framework and moving forward. Right. Uh, there have been a number of different court cases and things. Uh, without getting into the details of all the different legal uh, strategies and um, proposals that have been made, from a pedagogical standpoint, from the standpoint of teaching science, I think it's extremely constructive to teach the arguments and the controversies that have been part of science and, are, and, and which continue to be part of science. Uh, science as an enterprise advances as scientists argue about how to interpret the evidence. And what we often do in teaching uh, biology or physics or any of the sciences is we'll teach students the outcome of controversies or we'll teach them the consensus view about a controversial topic, and we won't teach them how we got to that point of view or why there might still be controversy, and we paper those things over. Last night, I was in Washington, D.C., and I spoke uh, at uh, a Socrates in the City event. that had a lot of uh, D.C. media people and, and policy wonks and politicians, and I started the talk by talk by... Uh, reciting a, a series of quotations that were conveying the consensus view that there is no controversy over Darwinian evolution. I ended the talk having explained why I am skeptical about Darwinian evolution with a series of quotes from mainstream evolutionary biologists who are now calling for a new theory of evolution because Darwin's mechanism of natural selection and random mutation has very limited creative power and we have no explanation for the origin of new biological form. So you have this huge disparity between the consensus view which is propagated by not only New York Times reporters, people like Richard Dawkins, spokesman for the new atheism, but also all the spokesmen and women for the major science teaching organizations. The consensus view is that there is no controversy. Darwinism is settled science. That was two days ago in the Boston Globe, a major uh, article because one of the presidential candidates had said that he was skeptical about Darwinism and then they had the whole establishment land on him. Um, so I, I think one of the things that's very constructive is we, we call it teaching the controversy. You don't have to teach uh, uh, a particular point of view. When you teach something, you don't have to tell students what to think, but you need to tell them the, the competing views and allow them to, um, to weigh the arguments as they are made by their chief proponents. That's just good science education. You need to know what people think and why. So um, that's, that's the approach that we favor. Now, the, the, the question is how broadly applicable can that be given the current constitutional climate? The, um, what's known as young earth creationism has been definitively ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Um, the status of intelligent design is still uncertain. It was, ruled it was ruled to be unscientific by a federal court judge in Pennsylvania, but uh, the, his jurisdiction was limited, and so the status, the constitutional status of intelligent design is has not been settled, but at the very least, and this is what we advocate for now, students should be allowed to know both the strengths and the weaknesses of Darwinian theory, and they should know the scientific criticisms of the theory as they are appearing in the peer-reviewed mainstream scientific literature. Anything less is just not good scientific literacy. Students need to know that there are scientists who criticize the theory, and they need to know why. That's part of learning about the theory. 
So that's our approach. Dr. Sproul, after uh, Dr. Meyer's talk uh, back here in the room, you mentioned, boy, that's, a, that's great apologetics. And there's a question here asking uh, an apologetical method question. Can you explain the difference between presuppositional and classical apologetics? And maybe uh, elaborate on what you meant by uh, even Dr. Meyer's talk and, and how you thought that that was, was a well-presented apologetical argument within a framework of the different schools of thought of approaching apologetics. There are different schools of thought with respect to apologetics. I can think of at least three right off the bat. There's presuppositionalism, and there are different uh, schools of that. There's axiomatic presuppositionalism that follows Gordon Clark, and then there's the other presuppositionalist school that follows Cornelius Van Til. And then there's a second approach to apologetics, which is uh, called evidentialism. And, uh, and then the third view that I espouse, which is called classical view of apologetics. So uh, there are lots of differences, Chris, and we'd, it would be unfair to try to uh, define them absolutely in the short term. But the fundamental differences in uh, presuppositional apologetics argues this way that the only way you can come to a sound conclusion of the existence of God is that you must begin with the assertion of God's existence. You must presuppose the existence of God in order to have a sound uh, argument for the existence of God. Uh, evidentialism sees that as circular, and which, of course, they don't have to that critique of presuppositions being circular in its reasoning process is not something that one must prove or display because, for example, in Van Til's defense of uh, presuppositional apologetics, he uh, not only admits, in fact, he wouldn't like the word admit, but he agrees that it is uh, circular, but he says in defense of that that the nature of all ar argument is circular, that the starting points and the conclusions are all bound up one with another. And what, what he means by that, I, I see two problems with that. One is if you admit that your method of proving the existence of God is circular and commits the petite principia uh, fallacy in logic, that you've already surrendered the rationality of your position, and you've given the unbeliever an excuse to reject your position because you have made a logical violation in the process. Well, Van Til acknowledges circular reasoning, but he defends it by saying, as I mentioned, that it's a particular type of circular reasoning. And in this case, he commits a second uh, informal fallacy, the one of equivocation, because the meaning of the term circular changes in the argument. He could have just as easily said that all arguments are by nature uh, linear, that if I start with a rational starting point and I'm come to a rational conclusion, that's not circularity, that's linearity. It's the same thing if I begin with an empirical premise and come to an empirical conclusion, I've just remained consistent in my methodology and there's no sin in that. The problem with the, uh, against that, uh, Epi uh, evidentialism says that we present concrete empirical evidence for the existence of God, arguing from nature and so on, and also from history and the like, and that that will give you a probability quotient of conclusion that would satisfy even somebody like uh, uh, David Hume in terms of the astronomical probability quotient that you achieve, but that even those arguments based on empirical investigation and so on and inferences drawn from them will not get you to formal certainty, that that can only be arrived at through a logical proof that is uh, irrefutable. And then, but classical apologetics say that the case for the existence of God can be proven demonstrably, rationally, and formally and compellingly. So it's a little stronger than evidentialists who are more empirically oriented. But what I said afterwards was that that's the way apologetics ought to be done. You don't just say, say to the scientific community, well, you're working on the wrong presuppositions or you have the wrong worldview. That's true. But you have to uh, 
begin to show them that, they're, that the conclusions that they've drawn from their own evidence are formally invalid, which is what I heard this morning, and I thought it was magnificent. One follow-up question is, uh, how do we explain why classical apologetics is not equated with rationalism? That's to me again. How do I answer the charge that it's the, well? You know, if I'm a, if I espouse to be human, that doesn't mean I've embraced humanism. If I argue that I exist, that doesn't mean that I am an advocate of existentialism. And just because a woman is feminine does not make her a feminist. All right, we want to be rational. To be rational is to think in a sound way. And uh, to be rational does not mean you embrace rationalism. And at the same time, you have to f understand that historically, in the field of philosophical inquiry, there have been three distinct types of rationalism. Cartesian rationalism, where rationalism is distinguished from empiricism, where the highest proof is found in the a priori categories of the mind, rather than a posteriori uh, demonstrations empirically, in that debate between uh, the 17th and 18th century. The second form of rationalism is the form you found in the Enlightenment, where the rationalism was, was distinguished not from empiricism, but from revelation, where reason was elevated above the uh, trustworthiness of supernatural revelation. Then the third kind of rationalism is the Hegelian rationalism in the 19th century, where reason is, uh, is elevated to the capital R where it is the highest reality, where reason itself becomes God. So when you talk, call me a rationalist, I want to know what kind of rationalist you're calling me, and I would deny all three of those, and uh, would, uh, would say I'm just trying to be rational. I hope that answers it. The alternative to that is, is everything outside the category of the rational is what? Irrational, yeah. We don't want that. Dr. Tackett, uh, you've done a lot of work uh, with the Truth Project and equipping Christians uh, to think with a robust worldview. And a question comes in regarding our next generation and our, our students, and do you have any suggestions for Christians who attend a secular college or university in regards to ways of avoiding indoctrination? Uh, Dr. Meyer mentioned even this very syndrome that happens, uh, particularly within the first year of some students going to college? Well, I do work with uh, university students. That's my heart, that's my love. And um, I usually say this, uh, it's, a, it's a subjective statement. Uh, there's no objective uh, test that leads me to it. It's just the observation I've had over years and years of working with university students uh, my personal opinion is that the, the college campus today is the most hostile ground in America uh, towards a biblical worldview. And that hostility comes uh, not just from the classroom, but the hostility comes uh, from uh, the campus itself and uh, the party life and all of the other things that accompany it. Um, at the same time, recognizing that uh, we're dealing with um, 18, 19 year old people, uh, and if we think of our, if we think in terms of Christian or Christian kids uh, who have been raised, and let's assume they've been raised in um, a, an intact family, they've been raised uh, in a, a church, they've gone to a youth group, uh, they've sat under preaching under a lot of authority. And so now you take um, an 18 or 19 year old and you remove all the authority in their life at a time where their hormones are raging and you now place them in the most hostile environment with all of the temptations that maybe they have not even come in contact with and you have a very volatile situation. And so, um, my personal uh, plea has been, not only to the college students, but to the parents as well, um, and to the church, is that 
we must get serious about equipping our young people for the battle because I do not believe we're doing a, a good job of that. And so it, from, from a, a military perspective, uh, it's like we're sending uh, our children into the, the fiercest part of the battle and we have not, they don't have a flak vest, they don't have combat boots, they don't have a helmet, uh, they're not armed. And, um, and, and the consequences are severe. I spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with college students. And um, I can tell you stories after stories after stories. I go through a lot of Kleenex in my office. And uh, partly for me and mostly for a student. Uh, where a young girl will be crying her eyes out uh, saying, I can't believe that this happened to me. And so that's, I see, what I, I see the uh, consequential end of that battle. And so I don't think uh, we're doing a good job of, of equipping them for that. Now, I don't mean to imply that therefore every university and every professor and every campus has reached the depth of depravity. Um, but there, let me tell you, there are places where it, you would think it's reached the depth of depravity. And so we have got to be more diligent in helping uh, our kids, uh, I may even speak about this tonight, um, go from being able to answer our Christian questions on a test to the point where they believe it. And not only believe it, but they have the ability to defend it. But they also have to be able to defend it, defend it in the environment in which they find themselves. Um, and they do not find themselves in an environment where they can simply point out a verse as uh, the evidence uh, for the reason for Christian faith. And, um, and that's why uh, Dr. Meyer... Um, and, uh, and we've worked together to try to produce those kinds of things that will help arm a student uh, with a lot of the natural evidence. So, for example, the veracity of the Scriptures, which is a huge issue on college campuses. The, the Scriptures are assailed over and over and over again. Um, but there Especially is, in biblical studies and theology classes. Yes, That's absolutely. Great place to lose your faith is in the biblical absolutely. studies or theology class. Um, in fact, let me, let me uh, run a little rabbit trail here for just a second, because um, if you think that sending your kids to a Christian school is going to be the answer, just because a university has a Christian brochure does not mean that they're not going to walk into an Old Testament class or a philosophy class and not get hit square between the eyes. In fact, I will tell parents that if you send your, your student to a Christian university, now there are some, again, there are some really good ones, but I'm talking just in, in general terms, you send your child to a Christian university, it is possible that they may be at a greater risk than the students that go to what we'll call a secular university because the Christian kids who go to a secular university have their antennas up. And a lot of kids who go to a Christian college, Christian college, have their antennas down. And so I, I can tell you stories of, of kids who have walked into their Christian campus and gone to their first Bible class and been told emphatically that the Scripture is not the Word of God that it was uh, created by men and all of the other things we hear in a Christian university. So they have to be prepared for that. They have to know how to do it, and they have to know how to argue, but they need to also know how to do it in a winsome way. They have to do it in an attractively winsome way, and they also need to learn how to get a good grade in the midst of that. So there's a lot of things that have to be, have to be done. Sir. Hey, Can I just add one? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Uh, well, um, the other thing they have to do is some homework outside of the classroom because they're not going to be provided with the evidence and the information, the modes of analysis, the ways of thinking. 
that are going to help them survive that challenge by the professors who are the source of that challenge. I'm talking about the in-classroom part of that. And Dell and I have had the, the, really the privilege of working together on this. It's, I'm following in his wake with a successful uh, truth project that he's done for a, primarily for adults, but that's, it's also a good resource for, for kids facing the challenge in college. But um, he and some good people at Coldwater Media approached me several years ago about uh, doing a film lecture series based on a course that I used to do called Reasons for Faith, some of the material I shared from that course today. And um, we've had a terrific collaboration in developing a, a Dell's been calling it a prequel to the Truth Project, because the Truth Project is, is looking at um, a Christian worldview and asking, how do you apply that to different spheres of life? But the prequel to that is asking why you should ever acquire a Christian worldview in the first place. And if you have one, how would you defend it? Because that's the challenge students face. And so we've developed, uh, uh, so far, two part, a two-part lecture series called True You, True University, you, you for short for university. Quick advertisement, yeah. they're both available in the bookstore. Terrific. And a number, a number of parents have asked us already this, in, in just the, the time of the conference about resources that can help equip their kids for that challenge. I just wanted to let people know that those resources are, uh, are in the bookstore, and also there'll be more coming. They're in production. I wanted to say that when I was in seminary, I had a theology professor that routinely criticized the integrity of the scriptures, but in an extremely bitter, hostile, and cynical way. And I was alone with him in his office one day, and I, I said to the professor, I said, you know, it's clear that you don't believe this is the Word of God, you don't believe in the deity of Christ, you've said that. But what you communicate to me is that you delight in your skepticism. I, I would think that if a, as a th theological professor, that if you came to the conclusion that the Bible was not trustworthy and that Jesus was not the Son of God, that you would come to that conclusion with tears. There is this arrogance out there, which leads me to my next question, why? Why is there so much hostility in this group that you're talking about towards the Scripture? I have a guess, and it may sound nuts, but I've seen in, in, in our own lifetime a, rev, a moral revolution in America centered around sexual practice. And you talk about the hormones raging. Every young person in America knows that the God of the Bible prohibits premarital sex. And every professor in college knows that the God of the Bible prohibits extramarital sex. Stop me if I'm lying here, right? So here is this strong appetite that you're talking about. People want to declare their freedom from that God of Mount Sinai who forbade adultery. And the only way to have liberty or libertinism is to do away with the source, to get away from that authority. It's a declaration of independence from a holy and righteous God whose word stands in judgment over our behavior. Now, I'm sure there are other elements involved in that, but I think that's an extremely powerful force, don't you? Uh, absolutely, and, uh, and, and this is the other thing I wanted to mention because it goes along with that. It, just, it seems to me that every time I've had this discussion, which is um, repeated over and over again, a student comes in, to, uh, we sit down together one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's you know, at the coffee shop or in my office or wherever it is, and I begin to hear the story. A Christian kid now crying their eyes out. And it, it can begin either in the classroom or it can begin at the party. Uh, the, the doubt in the classroom will lead to an indiscretion at the party. And the discretion at the party will lead to a doubt in the classroom, and partly, I think, because of what you're saying, R.C., is that 
once this begins, either guilt or desire, further desire drives you to want to get rid of the guilt. We don't like guilt. And the only way to get rid of guilt is to get rid of him, to get rid of an absolute standard. And so th they feed on each other. Uh, this indiscretion feeds on my um, lack of of a desire to go back to God, and, and, and the doubt over here will feed this, and it's like this death spiral. And it's, it's almost like it's every time I have the conversation, I can see that. Uh, but you're exactly right, because at some point, a sinful nature is going to do anything it can to remove that kind of, of, of a vision and a standard that I don't want to follow. I want to go to Dr. Sproul, uh, Jr., and then uh, Dr. Horton, I'm going to come to you as well, following up and go another level deep on this. Uh, the state of education of children has so deteriorated in terms of a biblical worldview. That's what you were saying, Dr. Tackett. So where do we go from here, both in the family and in the church? And Dr. Sproul, I'll ask you just from a, a convinced home educator uh, approaching education uh, with your convictions, uh, what have you sought to do in developing your philosophy of education? And then, Dr. Horton, we're going to come to you for how does the church uh, flesh this out from a covenantal perspective, and uh, how do we repair the ruins here? I'm not sure how easy it would be to answer the question without reiterating my talk from this morning. Um, the same uh, passions and convictions are going to animate uh, both of those things, principally this, that the, there's power in the Word. And uh, as I'm listening to this conversation over here, I'm sort of taking your experience and, and translating it into my own experience at the abortion mills. Uh, because one of the things that I, I, I've recognized over time is that evangelicals and Roman Catholics in the pro-life movement have spent the better part of the last 25 years uh, amassing evidence for the humanity of the fetus. And we have the, the, the intellectual firepower on our side. We've got the Human Genome Project. We've got uh, scholars across the country that are able to explain what's going on. Some of you may have seen online that beautiful uh, development of the fetus in the womb uh, little YouTube thing a few months ago. We have now uh, the technology to demonstrate this with, with uh, windows on the womb with uh, sonogram technology. And because we think in these terms, we think that when you go to the mill that there's a girl who thinks she's carrying a blob inside of her that's a problem. And she's going to go in there and get that blob taken care of. And we're there to tell her, no, it's a baby. Friends, just like everyone knows you're not supposed to be sleeping around, they all know it's a baby. All our scientific studies, all of our wisdom, all of our technology doesn't change what the issue is. They know it's a baby, and they will kill the baby. They will tell you, I know it's a baby. They will also tell you, but God will forgive me. One of the greatest evils that contributes to this same downslide is inside the church, this notion that we teach our kids that God loves you just the way that you are, that you have nothing to fear with respect to God's wrath, that God is all sweetness and light, there's no judgment, there's no nothing. And, and so we walk into the most profound evils covered in a false God that has nothing to do with the Bible. So what do we do? We give our children the Bible. You know, I could, I could sit here and, sp and spend the rest of our time talking bad about this program in the government schools and this sex ed thing they're doing here and, and that evolutionist thing they're doing there. And those are all bad things, but those are all symptoms. 
We have an entire structure where 90% of Christian parents send their children that begins with the premise, God shall not be mentioned here. And then we wonder why we lose these children. It's been a wonderful uh, uh, book by my friend Ken Hand called Already Gone that explores the phenomenon of professing Christian people leaving their faith in college. And what they discovered is they were gone before they got there. And it honestly began with issues of origins, where they were taught to doubt the veracity of the Bible even in their youth. And then they went to college, and that chink was already there. And, and boy, howdy, I can't beat that wisdom that it's happening at the party, uh, just like it's happening in the classroom. So what do we do? Well, in our family, we try to make sure we understand the Bible's God's Word. Uh, I think again, going to, to our pride that I tried to address this morning too, I'd also add this. When we say that, that the Bible, the Bible is the foundation of our family, that is a different thing from daddy is the foundation of our family. We teach our children to anchor their faith on our faith. Our children see our hypocrisy, and they're cut loose. We need to anchor our faith and our children's faith in the Word of God, which means when our behavior butts up against the Word of God, we say, I'm sorry. We repent. We sh we, th this is what Christians do. Christians repent when we're disobedient to the Word of God. And Daddy disobeys, disobeys you disobey, we all disobey. So at the end of the day, friends, the answer to every problem, it doesn't matter what year you come here to the Ligonier Conference, it doesn't matter what theme we're going to address, the answer to the question is to believe the gospel, to believe God's Word, and to proclaim God's Word, because that's what changes things. That's what changes us. That's what protects our children. That's what not just protects them, but makes them then able to go out, not just with the defensive weapons of the helmet and the boots and, and the flak jacket, but to go out with that roaring lion, which is God's Word, and let it loose and watch what it does. And now I'm starting to preach. Dr. Horton, what can the local church do to be able to come alongside of families and equip them and to repair the ruins of education? Well, I do, I do believe uh, that the home, the church, and the school are three-legged stools, um, that, uh, you know, there are, there are people who do so much repair work in the home that they can overcome some damage that has been done in the school. Uh, or, in some cases, kids who are in a, in a school where they're uh, at, at taught the Christian faith as well as uh, other subjects, and that modifies what they get in the home. But really, the, I think the ideal is, is uh, to, be, to be trained in the same worldview at home, at church, and school. And part of the problem, I think, is that our churches are... Are, I, I'm speaking very generally, very broadly. Our churches are dumbing down Christians at an alarming rate to such an extent that they are unarmed when they get to the university. And I wonder when people talk about over half of the evangelicals when, uh, uh, abandoning the faith in their sophomore year in college, I hear staggering, I don't know if that's accurate, but in staggering reports, I think, were they ever in church? They were in children's church, then they, the nursery, then children's church, then the youth group. They, you can go all the way to golden oldies without actually being in the church. <laughs> and you, we've so niche marketed and target marketed people, they're not associated with the church, and it's not the first thing they do when they go off to college. I have friends who went to very hostile secular universities and got in a good church, and they were fine. And then I have plenty of friends 
I myself went to a Christian university. I have plenty of friends who blow off Christianity like no secularist you can possibly imagine. They do a really good job because they say, we know it from the inside. They're cynical, deeply cynical. And those are the hard people to win back. I'll bet the Bible Belt will be the, 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 the most difficult mission field in 40 years, the burned over district. So much Bible this, Bible that, all culture, 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 culture. What is, the, what is it that we believe and why? What is the gospel? What do the scriptures teach? What is creation? Going through these doctrines, if kids can come out, and the, all of the statistics tell us, they can come out of evangelical Bible-believing churches without knowing the gospel. And these are gospel churches, Bible-believing churches, and they don't know the Bible. How can you even get then to the place where they're prepared to defend the truths of Scripture in a secular environment. So I think it, Dorothy Sayers, uh, the, the lost uh, art of learning, is, is a lot better uh, than what we have learned from John Dewey and uh, the, the child-centered approach to education. They go through these different stages, and we've got to be ready to, to catechize them in the early stages where they're just memorizing Scripture, they're memorizing the, the truth, and that's what those, we were talking about catechism earlier, that's what that was for, for. And then when they become adolescents, don't talk down to them like they're still in third grade. Encourage them to question it. Why do you believe what you believe? And a lot of apologetics can be done there, and some churches are doing that with resources like the Truth Project and, and other resources. Do it. Churches have a responsibility not to pass this off to others. Churches have a responsibility to catechize, to teach, and to give people apologetic armor, uh, give them good arguments to know not only what they believe but why they believe it, and then to find a good church once they get to a university wherever it is. Does the expression doctrine divides come out of anti-intellectualism? Who wants to jump at that? Yes. <laughs> Next. Could you elaborate? No. <laughs> I didn't say would you. <laughs> Could you? <laughs> Where does that idea come from, doctrine divides? Well, there's over 2,000... Protestant churches in America, denominations that uh, all claim to be teach, believing the Bible and believing true doctrine. And when we find in our fellowship that we have agreements and then all of a sudden run up against disagreements, it can cause serious division. I remember hosting a group of 25 charismatic guests from France back at the Ligonier Valley Study Center back in the 70s. And they were all excited to bear witness to their testimony of being united in the Spirit. And they sang the song, We're One in the Spirit. And there were Roman Catholics there, and there were Lutherans there, and, you know, sort of, I don't know if there were any Baptists there, but I don't know if they have any Baptists in France, but they had, you know, people from the Huguenot tradition. And so there were all these different groups. And they were all excited about their unity. And, and I just raised a question. I said, well, you're one in the Spirit. Well, how do you guys deal with the question of justification? Do you think that justification is by faith alone? Yes, I do. Well, do you? I said to the cat, no, I don't. In five minutes, they were at each other's throats. <laughs> and the idea was that if you want to keep the peace, you've got to never talk about doctrine. One of the most prominent Bible study organizations in America today that is doing a wonderful job of, ex, ex, uh, of showing the content of Scripture to people that are a part of this have a rule not to deal with theology. And I say, how in the world can you study the Bible without dealing with theology? When people say, I don't need any theology, all I need to know is Jesus, as soon as I say, who is Jesus, I'm asking a theological question. And if they say, well, I think Jesus is a great man, 
uh, but didn't perform miracles. That's his theology. And this guy said, oh, I think he's a great man who would be a liar if he wasn't doing the, what he said he was doing. And that divides, because truth divides. Now, it doesn't mean that it's necessary to create hostilities, that we are called not to be contentious people, that we are called to be tolerant and long-suffering. But this method, this, this mantra of doctrine divides becomes a thinly veiled license, I think, to tolerate the intolerable. There are theological differences that ought to divide us. There's a reason why the church divided itself from Arian, Arius in the fourth century. There's a reason why there was a Council of Nicaea. There's a reason why the church divided itself from the Monophysites and the Nestorians in the fifth century, because the biggest threat to Israel and her health in the Old Testament was not the Philistine armies or the Assyrians, it was the false prophet within their gates, the one who would distort and twist and undermine the truth of the Word of God. You know, Piper's right. He's, it's not just enough to know what we believe, and it's not just enough to defend what we believe, but there comes a place where the Christian has to be willing to contend for the truth, not to be contentious in our spirit, of course, but there are times where these truths are so sacred that we have to contend for them. Jesus himself said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword, to set brother against sister and mother and father and all of that, because the truth matters. I think one of the reason, reasons why liberals get along so well in the theological reason is they don't believe anything. <laughs> the only thing they divide themselves from is anyone who, who gives a whiff of orthodoxy. But as long as you don't believe anything, there's nothing to lose. Uh, you can be... You cannot believe in the incarnation, and I cannot believe in the virgin birth, and we can get along fine as long as we both don't believe anything. But as soon as something is precious to us in our faith, division enters the room. That's unavoidable. So putting a, uh, a real subject on the table, looking back on a scientific uh, lecture that Dr. Meyer provides, Looking at the age of the universe, a question uh, comes up as far as young earth versus old earth. So, so one question is, is that a, is that a first order issue? Is that an intramural uh, discussion? Um, and, then, and then if we could just go down uh, the panel here and just briefly state uh, how you approach that question as far as age of the universe. R.C., is it an intramural discussion? Uh, not for some people. For some people, it's, it's an all-or-nothing issue. Um, when people ask me how old the earth is, I tell them I don't know, because I don't. On the, and I'll tell you why I don't. In the first place is the Bible does not give us a date of creation. Now, it gives us hints and inclinations that would indicate in many cases, a young earth. And at the, at the same time, you get all this expanding universe and all this astronomical dating and triangulation and all that stuff coming from outside the church. That makes me wonder, and I'll tell you why. I believe firmly that all of truth is God's truth, and I believe that God has not only given revelation in sacred Scripture, but also in the sacred scripture itself tells us that God reveals himself in nature, which we call natural revelation. And I once asked a seminary class of mine that was a conservative group, I said, how many of you believe that the God's revelation in scripture is infallible? And they all raised their hand. I said, well, how many of you believe that God's revelation in nature is infallible? And nobody raised their hand. It's the same God who's giving the revelation. But what they were getting at was they were saying not every scientific theory is compatible with the Word of God. And that's true. But historically, 
the church's understanding of special revelation or the Bible has been corrected by students of natural revelation with the Copernican Revolution. Both Calvin and Luther rejected Copernicus as a heretic in the 16th century. I don't know anybody in Orthodox Christianity today who's pleading for geocentricity. Do you? Do you know anybody? In that case, the church had to say, yeah, but the church has said, look, we misinterpreted the teaching of the Bible with respect to the solar system, and thank you, uh, scientists, for correcting our misunderstanding. And so I think that we can learn from uh, non-believing scientists who are studying natural revelation. They may get a, a better sense of the truth from their study of natural revelation than I get from ignoring natural revelation. So I have a high view of natural revelation, as I'm saying. However, if something can be shown to be definitively taught in the Bible without question, and somebody gives me a theory from natural rev that they think is based on natural revelation that contradicts the Word of God, I'm going to stand with the Word of God a hundred times out of a hundred. But again, I have to repeat, I could have been a mistaken interpreter of the Word of God. But again, I don't, I don't have to face that problem because I believe that both spheres are God's spheres of revelation, and that truth has to be compatible. So if they seem to be in conflict, and if they are in conflict, if a theory of science, natural science, is in conflict with a theological theory and contradicts it, here's what I know for sure. Somebody's wrong. And I don't leap to the conclusion that it has to be the scientist. It may be the theologian. But nor do I leap to the conclusion that it has to be the theologian. It can well be the scientist, because we've got fallible human beings interpreting uh, infallible natural revelation, and fallible human beings interpreting uh, infallible special revelation. Now, having said that, I don't know. That's a long way to say I don't know how old the earth is, but I'd like to hear what Stephen says about that. <laughs> For those who have been following the development of the intelligent design research community, people may be aware that we have, uh, for the most part, studiously avoided uh, not so much addressing the question, but making it any kind of focus of our work. And part of the reason for that is uh, that the issue has, a, a, first of all, not all members of the intelligent design research community are theists or even Christians, uh, or Christians or even theists, uh, said, but many of us are. I'm a Christian, I'm a theist, I'm also an advocate of intelligent design. W among those of us who are Christians, I think that we're acutely aware that the age of the earth has become a strangely toxic issue within the Christian uh, th within the Christian church. And I had an opportunity a few years ago to attend a creation conversation that was uh, set up to, to try to sort out these differences among advocates of the young earth and advocates of the old earth view of creationism. They were all creationists. And I was asked to give an opening talk on the methods by which we weigh evidence. Uh, similar, to, I was talking about that method of inference to the best explanation. And I was trying to explain how people of goodwill could come to different uh, views about things like this based on how they weighed competing classes of evidence and that uh, these things weren't always simple. I can't, then the advocates of the different views set about to argue their cases with each other. I left the meeting thinking that what we needed more than excellent exposition or uh, additional scientific data or greater philosophical acumen was a good Christian counselor to help with the communication skills that were in evidence. Because the, sub, the, the messages that were being sent, the subtext, you know, the, the, the old earth people were saying, you know, without saying in so many words, they were saying to the young earth people, you ignoramus is bringing disrepute to the church with your uh, you know, backward view of things and your ignorance of geology, etc. And the young earth people saying to the old earth people without saying so in so many words, um, 
you compromising liberals, you know, you, you, uh, you know, always going with the secular science establishment instead of standing on the word of God. Oh my goodness, you know, it, 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 it's toxic. And from the standpoint of prioritizing the issues, um, I do think it's a tertiary issue. The first issue is whether or not, the first issue is the reality of God. Is God real or imaginary? This is the issue that Romans 1 speaks to. It's the, and in our time, the primary apologetic uh, challenge to the church is coming from this dominant secular materialistic worldview. And while we Christians have been busy arguing with each other over how long ago it was that God created, we've given the secularists a pass on the fundamental issue of the day, which is the reality of God versus this materialistic worldview. I think a second issue, a, a secondary issue is, can we know that from the things that are made? This is what Paul insists on in Romans 1, that the reality of God is knowable from what's been made. And then it is a perfectly interesting and acceptable issue to discuss how long ago it might have taken place. How do we interpret these days of Genesis? But we have focused so much attention on that issue, and we've, missed, we, we, we've strained at gnats and... and um, and, and pass through the camels. So we in the ID movement have tried to make that issue one that can be discussed uh, uh, um, congenially or you know, in, a, in a friendly way among the different participants in this scientific research program. And we have people of different views on that. But as Philip Johnson, who's in some ways the, the, the founder of the way for us, uh, he put it, it should never have become a causus belli, a, a cause for war. This is something that we can discuss amicably and uh, so it's it's been that's been our approach and in some ways I'm I I'll tell you what my view is I don't really want to justify it very much especially in this context because it, it becomes very quickly a deviation from that approach and I, I will tell you I hold an old earth view and I um, but I, I I tend to the view that that anatomically modern man our species is fairly recent much more recent than you get from the paleoanthropologists. So I have a kind of a hybrid view. I have colleagues within the ID movement who are, um, who are young earth people and with whom I collaborate on important scientific projects. Uh, Paul Nelson in particular is a very close friend and collaborator. So um, we're, we're trying to approach this issue in a different spirit rather than settle it. And I have people that I respect who are excellent biblical expositors on both sides of the issue and I have scientist friends on both sides of the issue, I would say that our focus is on a more primary issue, and I think it'd be good for, for the church to, to have some, it is important to understand that truth divides. At the same time, there are primary truths and there are secondary truths, and there are ones that are maybe even further down the list, and, it, it, and having some sense of the ranking and the priority of those things is important so that we can keep our, our focus on, on the, really the, the primary challenge of the day. So that's... Dr. Tackett? So are we out of time? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a very, very de divisive issue that uh, shouldn't be divisive, but it is. And... Uh, Del, before you go for... Can I say one other thing? Um, I, well, just, we, the, we only was, have 20 seconds, yeah. so take okay. it. Well, it's, no, I'm, it's, kidding. I'm kidding. You're hoping I leave you no time. Please, that's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a really great uh, person that many people know, Lee Strobel. He's written a wonderful book. Uh, he's written a series of apologetic books. And one of the books that he's written is The Case for Creator. Okay? And, uh, and we've done some conferences with Lee, and we have had people in the audience of all different, all different points of view on this, on this issue. But the primary affirmative thing that Lee has argued, in some ways based on a lot of the work that's been done in the ID movement, he's popularized you know, the privileged planet hypothesis or the, the William Lane Craig's cosmological argument. Or, and many of these arguments that are coming out of the ID movement are age neutral. You don't need to accept one view or the other to, to make them work. And what happens in churches, even in churches where people have a very definite view one way or another, once they see that, that, that there is a winning argument being offered, people suddenly say, you know, I'm really not all that exercised about this issue. People got the idea that I needed to defend one view or the other to have some credibility to make the scripture work so that my apologetic would work. And when uh, my, my, the analogy that I've often given is it's like a, um, a dog with a stick. 
and the dog is clenching, and you try to pull the stick out of the mouth, and the dog you know, is not going to g g release it. Then you add a give the dog a nice juicy bone, and suddenly the stick is not nearly so important. And uh, I think what we've seen in some of these case for creator conferences that we've done with Lee Strobel is when people see there is a winning affirmative argument that maybe doesn't settle all these theological questions, they suddenly relax and say, what I was really looking for was an affirmation of the core tenets of my faith in the face of this secular scientific um, challenge. And I now realize that maybe I don't need to make my response on those terms. There may be a more effective way to do that. And I think what the church has been looking for is not only truth, but a truth that transforms, that renews, that, that is persuasive. And the, some of the things that are coming out of this, um, the, the ID movement and focusing on these tremendous developments in science that are showing us that there's a strong affirmative case in the, in the mode of Romans 1. From the things that are made, we can see the evidence of the reality of God. That's really what people have been looking for. And that gives us some space to have these other conversations without feeling like so much is hanging on them. Because what we're all really feeling is the pressure from this secular juggernaut. And, and now that some people are coming out of the woodwork and, and finding a better way to respond to that, people, people, I think, are relaxing about this other issue and able to deliberate on it more in a way that is less toxic, less accusatory, one to another within the church. So, well, I, I hope that does continue. Yes, just a minute. I just wanted to see how gracious and patient you could be. I owe you. Del Tackett is a very Go gracious ahead, man. No, no, please. Uh, I was just kidding. <laughs> okay. um, I, I fall on the other side uh, of this issue. And... Um, I think there's, there's some critical things that, that need to be um, addressed in this. And RC, you did an excellent job here in the beginning because we all need to understand that um, God has revealed himself both in uh, natural revelation and in special revelation. And that all truth is God's truth and that they can't contradict each other. And so if we find a contradiction between these two, we must uh, be willing to accept that we might be wrong in our interpretation of special revelation or we might be wrong in our observation and our conclusion from natural revelation. Um, when, and here, the, uh, another piece here that's so very important is that from my, my observation, time and lots of time can be used as a very easy way uh, to cover up the glory and majesty of God's creation. Do you know what I mean by that? In other words, given enough time, time is like the magic wand. So that if, if time is not an issue, oftentimes people will use time as the creative force to bring about anything. And so th there is, I think sometimes there's a motive there that can drive us into wanting to have a lot of time. Because an evolutionist cannot, they cannot accept a young earth. Because a young earth will pull the rug out from underneath any kind of a theory of evolution. So there's a motive there. There has to be a motive in order to uh, have a very, very old universe, a very, very old earth. I think that's important to keep in mind because a motive can also sway your observation so that if, if our observation, which we would hope would always be an honest observation of the evidence around us, we know that's not true. We know that we're swayed by our presupposition and by our own desires. So what I would say is that if you want to see an old earth, you're going to look at evidence to support an old earth. If you want to see a young earth, you will look at only the evidence to support a young earth. So there are motives that have to be understood in this as well. Now, I think one of the problems that we have in the observation of the natural realm 
is that if you do not begin with a, a, a primary uh, understanding the, of special revelation, then we can view n- the natural world from a wrong presupposition. And let me give you one example. It is my personal opinion that the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, uh, was a law that came into being at the fall. I do not believe that God created a universe that was dying. I do not believe that when he created everything that the law of entropy was in action. That the law of entropy as we know it, as we've observed it today, is actually an observation of the groaning of the universe, the groaning of creation that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, that everything died, not just man. The natural realm uh, began to decay, began to die. If that is true, then when we are looking uh, back through that wall, to try to go back in time to determine, for example, how old the universe is, we're looking back through that wall that may distort our observation. Now, I agree with you. I don't think God is fooling us. But if we understand uh, the principles of the fall and what happened, it's not that he's fooling us. I think he's giving us an understanding we need to be wise in our observation. It's just if you, if you were um, a Native American Indian and your, uh, your source of food were fish in the, in the pond, in the lake, and you had your spear, if you throw your spear at where the fish appears to be, you'll be wrong because of the, of the refraction that occurs as light goes through that medium. So all I'm saying is that if we're looking back into time through a wall that separates a dying universe from a universe in which there was no second law of thermodynamics as we know it today, no law of decay, what kind of universe did that look like? What what were uh, the operations of how the universe, the speed of light even? Who knows? I don't know. All I'm saying is that I think that our, our, the observation of the physical realm must also take into consideration what we know to be true uh, and, and the, the truth about the creation that God gave to us and the subsequent fall must be taken into consideration when we're making that kind of a long-term observation. Would you say that that has anything to do with the debate between catastrophism and uniformitarianism? Because the assumption that, that, and that Steve talked about earlier, is that one of the assumptions that's made is that the laws that the, as we observe them today have always been in effect. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Correct. That maybe they haven't always been in effect. That's always a possibility. I mean, I remember, you know, seeing that thing about Mount St. Helens where the stratification and Mount, uh, there in Washington that was laid down in 15 minutes by the volcanic uh, eruption appeared to be identical with uh, uniformitarian stratifications that supposedly took millions of years to accomplish. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. But at the same time, even though that's a possibility, Dell, I don't think that really solves, solves it all that easily. I mean, we still have to take into account this data and say, how valuable is it? How, how, even if it's a decaying world and shouldn't be a decaying world, does the law of entropy still apply? Is the expanding universe moving towards a state of disorganization or isn't it? I mean, all the evidence would indicate that it is moving towards a state of disorganization. We, we had the boop, 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 Doppler effect. <laughs> so what do you do with that? I mean, I'm just saying, I don't know. I'm not taking a stance on it, but I'm just, I want to, I don't think that all of the data is in yet. But where we need to fight is who started this thing and, and who he is and how powerful he is. It's theism that's at stake. 
And that's the target of the secularists, it's the target of the materialists, it's the target of the naturalists. If they can do away with creation, they've done away with Christianity and Judaism and theism. And so that's where we have to fight the battle. And I think that's what Stephen's saying here. If we get caught up in the other things, we, we, we have a bad strategy. I absolutely agree with that, R.C. But I also agree, not only do we have to fight creation, we have to fight the reality of the fall. Sure. Because if we do not fight the reality of the fall, then we have no need of a savior. And so it's not just creation. It's the reality well, of, it's of, of death creation. and suffering that came from I'm the I'm just disability. saying that where the guns are aimed from the, from the atheists or yeah. creation. I mean, uh, how many atheists are you saying, are they yelling about saying there was no fall? Well, they want to deny the history of Adam, but if I say, are you a sinner? These guys will all admit that they're being sinners. As inconsistent that is with their worldview, because with their worldview, there is no such thing as sin. But, but they don't claim to be perfect people. So in one sense, the issue for them isn't the fall, but the reality of our, of mm -hmm. our uh, corruption. But without, without a discussion regarding uh, even, even the issue of evil and suffering, right. that whole, the, the whole notion of, of evil and suffering and the argument associated with that has, it does not begin with creation other than to say that God didn't create it the way it is. That, you know, I, mean, I hear what you're yeah. saying, and I, 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 we don't. I, really, I'd yeah. never be in a position to argue with you. Well, of course not. When you, <laughs> you're way too smart for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and Dell, there are there are biblical theologians um, who hold a high view of Scripture in a um, in an errantist view. For example, Jack Collins at Covenant Seminary who not only hold and an, have a very el well-elaborated uh, uh, biblical exegetical argument for an old earth, but also have uh, developed a very careful old earth views of theodicy that, that bring that into account. My point is simply that, um, you, you know, th those, are, those are important issues and they need to be approached in a different spirit than we've approached them before. And with... And so the, um, you know, you're saying a lot, you're raising lots of points that I'd like to take offline and continue because of the long friendship we've had, and we'll have a different kind of conversation about this than the ones that have been going on in the church because of the mutual trust we have and the collaborations that we've enjoyed, and uh, and, and that that's that's what I'm arguing for. I think there's a lot more in this issue than the caricature, cookie cutter cutouts that each side has of the other, and that that's, and I think we need to have some appreciation of that when we approach this so that we don't fall back into the same kind of pitfalls in, in rupturing unnecessarily Christian unity over um, I issues that are, you know, I, I agree, if there's no historical Adam, you can't have a fall, you can't have an atonement. Uh, there are some things that are really central, but um, how long ago those events took place, uh, I don't think um, it, there's not as much at stake at that in whether or not there was an Adam and there was a real fall. So, um, and, and I think as I've surveyed the discussion both on the biblical exegetical side and on the scientific side, I, I'm, I'm content to, to allow that discussion to take place but in a context where we can lower the amperage on it. And, and that, that's, that's primarily what I'd like to contend for in a, in, a, in a setting like this. If people want to ask, you know, me or you or, or we have a discussion, they're fascinating issues, and there's no reason we shouldn't be talking about them, because we all do revere the, the Word of God, but understanding exactly what it means and how you integrate the two sources of revelation and how we weigh competing things and competing insight, you know, I'll, uh, there's things I'd love to say about my particular view of, of the Genesis text, but I, I know as soon as you introduce that into the conversation, unless you've set the context as far as what are the ground rules of how we're going to proceed in this discussion that's been so toxic, just saying certain things, say, no, 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 someone will say, that's not right, so and so other theologian says it's this way of reading that Hebrew word, and then, and then you're off to the races, you know, and somehow we've got to get out of that, or else we're not going to make progress on this, and that's, 
We're quickly uh, escaping our time, but I do want to give Dr. Horton and then Dr. Sproul just a, a, a couple minutes, uh, if you could. <laughs> Thank you for the parameters. Uh, well, the, um, I, I think, first of all, it has, a lot of this has to do with the scope of Scripture. The, early, the, the easiest thing to do here is to do what many have done, sadly, and to say uh, that, that Scripture is a, is a good resource for truth about, uh, a, about spiritual things but not natural things. If, if Scripture told me in, in, in terms that, that, that uh, you know, I think that the, the whole church could recognize as the plain sense of, of Scripture how old the earth was, I would go with the Scriptures. All truth is God's truth, but not all truth is in the Bible. And that's why we've been talking about these two books. And our older theologians used to talk about, this isn't the first time uh, most of the scientists, uh, you know, in the past were, were priests or, or theologians or, you know, uh, in, in uh, 16th and 17th centuries anyway. They had all sorts of differences between each other about how to interpret the science and Scripture, my concern here is that we are going beyond the scope of Scripture in trying to decide matters that, that the Bible itself doesn't address. I embrace an old earth view mainly on exegetical grounds, and I know that we could disagree amongst ourselves about those exegetical grounds, but I can honestly say as an inerrantist, uh, as someone who goes to the Bible for uh, my interpretations, I, I, I conclude from Scripture itself that uh, I don't think that the Scriptures alone by themselves would give me that, but I think that, that they are very consistent with an older perspective. Having said that, I, if, if Scripture itself doesn't teach this, if it's beyond the scope of Scripture to address the question of how old the earth is, as Calvin said, uh, Moses was not an astronomer, <laughs> Uh, and I, th I think Moses wouldn't have understood the conversation today, what you were doing here. He was not infallible. His writing is infallible. Uh, he didn't know everything about the cosmos. Uh, Paul didn't know everything. Uh, we know more modern science than, uh, than Paul did. They wrote infallibly by the Holy Spirit what they wrote. Beyond that scope, we ought to let the scientists tell us, I believe, the age of the rocks. <laughs> well, I, I'm a, a young earth guy, not for exegetical reasons, but for sound exegetical reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew it. I knew it. But uh, it, so that we don't end up with doctrine dividing, I do want to uh, point out an important uh, commonality here that, that surprised me. Uh, listening to Dr. Myers talk about these meetings and the undertones that were being said, and I thought, well, I, I knew where you were going. I could imagine that happening, could have imagined being there. But what you may not know, because if you don't spend enough time with young earth guys like I do, is that we have this in common too. I do fear that there are people in the church who are afraid to be embarrassed in front of the heathen who will do whatever they can to avoid disagreeing with what they think the heathen have demonstrated through natural revelation, and that which is that undercurrent that you were you were hearing. Why are you people compromising uh, with the world? What I've found out in, in young Earth circles, though, is they do the same thing. You listen to some young Earth apologists, and you're thinking, well, if the science changed, they would change. Their their, their confidence is not. The, thus saith the Lord, their confidence is our scientists are better than your scientists. You know, I, as a young earth guy, I am persuaded that the Bible does speak to the issue. I'm perfectly content to not, uh, well, I, I would ask not to be required to defend uh, the good bishop's specific uh, uh, year framework and all of that. Yes, uh, October 4th. Uh, <laughs> 4,004, I'm not, uh, the Bible does not say that, I know that, uh, 
But I, I sincerely believe that while we can do all sorts of wonderful work on intelligent design, we can do all sorts of work on, on thinking God's thoughts after him and how he did this, I think, and, and while I agree with, with Dr. Horton that the Bible doesn't say everything, uh, I, have, I have pitched my tent on Yom. And that's where it's going to stay. Now, again, other exege exegesis can make reasonable cases inside the camp about what you mistakenly think that word can mean. Uh, <laughs> but I went from old earth to young earth as a seminary student when my Old Testament professor taught me that if you want to understand the text now, you have to understand how the text was understood then. And that settled it for me. Well, wait a minute. I'll wait. I would agree that most, I mean, probably all young earth advocates are seven-day creation advocates, and would agree with your understanding of Yom. But the converse is not true. Not everyone who believes in a seven-day creation is necessarily a young earth advocate. Keep that in mind. Sure. I, I understand. Okay. I understand. <laughs> now, this is a truth that we can't have divide us. Because a house divided against itself could not stand. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. Let's thank our panelists.